I'm uh, Mark Johnson. I'm currently working at the University of Copenhagen and the University of Liverpool, quite weirdly, but anyway, that's a long story. I, I rather like this quote from Ross Ashby, which I put on the slide as I've been listening to the presentations, because I, I do think, I think this is incredibly complex and it's very easy to get lost in the complexity. And I think if there is any sk essential skill that a cybernetician has, it is learning how to simplify in, a, in, a, in an effective way. And that's what I'm gonna try and hope to do. What I really want to say is, I think John is presenting a hypothesis, which is important. Um, and I think it's important for cybernetics. And what it is really saying is that there is a kind of elision, uh, an interference pattern between synchronic processes and diachronic processes. So that, just think about what that means. So the structures that we perceive around us and the way that they're structured have an interference with their historical development. And that's a deep historical development. And I'm interested in this because I'm also a musician and music seems to me to work on this principle. And I wrote a paper with uh, Lope Leidersdorf very recently um, where we, used uh, various ways of exploring how this interference pattern between synchronic and diachronic works. John is saying the same thing, but he is going right back to deep history. And I think that's, that's very important and very interesting. Um, I suppose my own personal journey here is through trying to understand the things that I've enjoyed in my life. I've, I've enjoyed music very much. And I've also enjoyed mathematics and logic. And I look to people like Blaise Pascal, who says the heart has its reasons, which reason knows nothing. Uh, Gregory Bateson was very fond of quoting this. Uh, I kind of look at that and I think, well, it's a bit of a cop out, isn't it? I, I want to know more about this. But maybe the way we reason about it needs, needs to be looked at in a different way. And on the left hand side, uh, a nice sort of elision of passion and logic is the stone that uh, William Rowan Hamilton carved in uh, elation at having discovered the uh, quaternions and these uh, three dimensional complex numbers, which uh, I'm going to come back to because they're very important when we come to look at quantum mechanics. Now, um, John is not the first person to think in terms of this originary um, idea, in terms of how we think, how we reason about the world, the nature of the world. Edmund Husserl wrote an extraordinary um, short book called The Origin of Geometry. And um, Husserl, also a mathematician, was basically asking the question, so when I look at a triangle or I look at a, a, a geometric form, what's happening? Am I looking at this mind independent thing or am I participating in some sort of social convention, some sort of social process? And his argument in his book is that he is participating in a historical process, that he sees a geometric form as a synchronic structure, but that synchronic structure exists in a history of perception of which the he, as in perceiving this at this particular point, is participating, reproducing, and, and it's ongoing. Now, I've got a little blue dot. I was playing with the Microsoft 3D stuff here, not doing very well. Um, I think John is saying actually the first geometer, which is what Husserl is interested, the first geometer might be a cell. And that's a very interesting idea. So, but I think the important thing is here, we've got this interference between synchronic and diachronic process. And this is what, I'll just move uh, Jason out of the way there. This is what Husserl says about it. Geometry must have arisen out of a first acquisition, out of a first creative activities. We understand its persisting manner of being. It is not only a mobile forward process from one set of acquisitions to another, but a continuous synthesis in which all acquisitions maintain their validity. And I, I introduced John to this, um, this book quite recently. It was very interesting. His reaction was, uh, um, it, it was one of recognition, I think. I'm sure he'll confirm that. And, um, in music, of course, this diachronic and synchronic um, uh, process is, is evident if you look at 
the way that music works and loads of my paper is is here if you're interested but i've got this this tool on the left hand side it's basically a real time um sound spectrum analyzer and i can just do a quick demonstration so here here it is analyzing my voice and i can sing a note la and when i explain this stuff to people i say well how many notes have you sung? And they say, well, we've sung one note. So why have you got all these multiple, why, why have we got these different parallel lines? And perhaps some of them that are informed about the nature of a sound might say, well, it's, there are many frequencies going on at the same time. But this is, this is such an important point really, because the synchronic structure is always a multiplicity. You think we, when we look at single things, we're always, receiving multiple descriptions it's it's another point that gregory bateson made a lot and there are two dimensions of that multiplicity because i can in fact i'm going to do it now so um if i if i sing a, a, a just um raise my voice la you can almost paint with it it's great fun but um of course, you've not just got the synchronic structure at a particular point in time, but you've got this diachronic dimension as well. And in proper music, not the horrible noise that I'm making, those things work together. It's not random. It's, it's a process of um, uh, filling out some kind of pattern which is unfolding in the interference between these two dimensions. So it, music is a very, very powerful um, metaphor for I think the, the overall process that John is talking about. Now so we come to John's work itself and I'm, I'm going to take a, a walk through you can almost imagine John's uh, thesis as a long tape and I'm going to run this tape back so uh, we start with the different organs in the body in different species so this is the this is phylogenetic um, uh, dimension and each of those organs, whether it's in a fish, frog, reptile or something, they're, they're in dynamic uh, relationship with their environment. So this is the epigenetics that John is talking about. But each of those organs, of course, is comprised of cells of different types. Now, and those different types seem to reproduce across different species. Where do the different types come from? Well, they come from the ontogeny of the organism, the, the way that the zygote develops. And the key stage is the gastrula. Gastrulation is where the three layers, the mesoderm, the ectoderm, and the endoderm are formed. And they are the basis for the diversity of cells. Isn't it remarkable that we've got so many cells in our body, so many different types of cells, and yet they all work together. There's nothing random about it. If it didn't work together, we, we wouldn't be here. That's incredible. That's a very powerful metaphor for society, I think. Now, but where do those different types of cells come from? Well, this is John's cell phylogeny. So he's saying that there is an originary um, unicell and in different environments, in primeval environments, it acquires different properties, different mechanisms. So this process, there's a, an underlying pattern all the way through. And, and I think the question is whether the pattern is the same all the way through. Is it some sort of synchronizing uh, dimension to this? And you then go further back and think, okay, so where does the pattern start? Where does, where does the pattern come from? And we end up thinking about quantum mechanics and the relationship between the quarks and electrons and the spins and all of these different things. And there's a colleague of mine um, whose engagement with these questions and engagement with John has been very important called Peter Rowlands. And uh, Peter Rowlands has been talking about some very powerful mathematical ideas using the ideas of the quaternions to actually explain the patterning which is present in quantum mechanics and then expanding that out into uh, biology and so on. And I think there's been a very powerful sort of elision between this, these ways of thinking. So just to sort of um, draw back to a sort of cybernetic world and, and maybe a bit of um, relationship with the physics, I think what I see in this is a kind of very deep homeostasis. This is not the homeostasis of the thermostat, where you've got a sort of structural relation with, you know, a room or a person getting too hot or too cold and a switch flicking back backwards and forwards. It's not even 
the rather more sophisticated um, multi-level homeostasis that you might find in something in uh, Stafford Beer's viable system model or uh, Gordon Pass's conversation theory. This is something deeper where the homeostasis is with the entirety of evolution and the in, actually, if you broaden it out, the entirety of the cosmos. And to physicists, I think this probably isn't surprising because uh, we've had everyone from Newton, Newton's third law, um, Einstein, I've got Einstein's uh, mass energy momentum equation here and Dirac's equation for um, quantum mechanics. And they're kind of, they're all about nothing in various ways. All of those equations can be expressed in terms of the expressions e equaling naught. And Peter Rowland's contribution here has been very powerful um, because basically he takes that equation, E squared equals MC squared squared plus P, uh, rho C squared and just factorizes it using the quaternions. Um, I, I won't have time to do it now, but basically if you take these principles of the quaternions and you see these variables here, uh, it does actually work. It produces nothing. And, um, and that's incredibly important because if we're talking about patterns running all the way through nature, all the way from quantum mechanics to um, biology through to conversation and consciousness, what is a pattern? Well, a pattern is nothing unless it's got holes in it, unless it's got gaps. And so the very fact that nature cancels itself out, particular alignments of parameters and variables, that seems to be very important. And that's something which I think is, is uh, uh, something that allows us to do uh, different kinds of experiments. And that, that lay at the heart of uh, some of the experiments I was doing with music. Um, a very interesting quote from Robert Alanovich here. It's it basically saying what I've just said. It's very difficult even to talk about patterns without referring to the absences or holes in spatial arrays. Yes, I think so. We need the holes. And so we take John's stuff and we roll the tape forwards and we, um, we uh, obviously we've all got our organs and they make up our bodies and eventually we get to you and me, ourselves, but ourselves exist in a social context. We're always engaging in an environment, both in terms of communication and in terms of biology. This is what the epigenetics is about. And uh, this diagram that's just appearing here is a diagram which I uh, drew with Lowe to try and explain um, Alfred Schutz's theory of musical communication, the idea that when people play music, they're somehow able to tune into each other. Well, that's, that again, that's to do with a pattern. There's a pattern going on there. Um, and I think it's also to do with our tools. So uh, very interestingly, our machine learning tools and uh, what you're seeing appear on the screen at the moment uh, is uh, the convolutional neural networks which sit behind so much of our automatic image processing. Just look at this, look at the patterns here because it's basically a, a recurring decreasing fractal. It's exactly what John's saying in terms of the way that uh, his evolutionary theory is working. So I'm just gonna run this and eventually, uh, of course I meet David Bohm. And um, David Bohm is in some sense, um, well, he's saying in some sense, Man is a microcosm of the universe. Therefore, what man is, is a clue to the universe. We are enfolded. He, he's the, he's the sellotape that joins the two ends of this strip together. It's, it's not one long line, it's a circle. So I, I have to say, I'm very proud of this. I spent a long time in Blender trying to make a Merbius strip with, um, with uh, the uh, strip. But basically you can see that I think you can stand anywhere on this and we're not dealing with history as something in the past. We're always dealing with history as something which is in a, in a kind of topological circular relationship. And that seems a very cybernetic thing to me. Um, and uh, a little while ago, Lou wrote a lovely paper uh, about um, uh, paper computers. And he, he, he put this thing, which has now disappeared. But uh, long ago and far away, there was a primeval soup of curled up single self-referential inverters, each oscillating away, ignoring all the others. Perhaps they were a product of the Big Bang. And he he's drew, drew this little uh, diagram uh, to illustrate what he means. It's, it's a, a beautiful sort of Lewis Carroll style uh, thing from Lou there. But, that, but this is, this is um, a very important part of his work. Now, I wanna finish by mentioning Gordon Pask because a lot of this thinking and, and some of the groups that P 
people like Peter Rowlands and Lou are part of are very concerned with physics. And I only discovered last year because I hosted their conference. This is a group called the Alternative Natural Philosophy Association. I only discovered that Gordon Pask was absolutely instrumental in the thinking of the physicists. And I know we've got a few, quite a few people here who were either past students or knew him very well. And whether you know about this, but this is uh, a man called Ted Bastin, Clive Kilmister and uh, David McGovern. And they are talking about Gordon Pask's contribution to fundamental physics. And I, I think this is truly fascinating. So, ah, now you might not be able to hear it. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna stop sharing because I need to share my sound, just hold on. Let's do that again. Sorry, it's my fault. Share sound. Where is it? Share computer sound. Right, here we go. Okay, now you can see it and you should be able to hear it. I should say there was a previous and intermediate stage where, where we were thinking strongly in digital terms, but actually using um, control systems. Um, and Gordon Pask's intuition, Gordon Pask provided the control systems out of ex WDX War Department staff that was available very cheaply after the war. We had a room at least the size of this, which was entirely occupied by one control system, and it, it used about five kilowatts to run. It made whirring noises, and it started up in one place, and then the activity would transfer to the other, other parts. And it, Pask's idea was that one could have a, a mechanical system which would incorporate all the possibilities, everything that could happen, given a random input, but, but uh, and, and in which also, by our structures, uh, <clears throat> the different elements on the set of the system, which were, when you say elements, each was about that size and vastly complicated, but they were elements in the sense that they were separable pieces, and they had this important property that they had to be made exactly like every other, which was actually difficult with that crude equipment. Uh, um, and he thought you could actually, you you could actually um, have a process in, um, which was capable of doing everything. A, a funny idea, and very related to modern ideas of chaos. Mm. Uh, in fact, I think he yeah. was he was the originator in the real sense of the idea of, mm. of the chaos notion. That uh, from a very an, an, uh, an indefinitely small variation in two different parts you could mm. you could you could stimulate that's the uh, yeah. indefinite mm. much greater active because he okay i'm going to leave it there but that's a tantalizing one for i know nick's here and uh, bernard and anybody else in you pask um if you know about anything about this this would be very interesting that's it thank you wow klaus you want to say something? We, we want to test your microphone. You, you mute it. You still mute it. Yes, but I uh, oh, I wonder okay. if I wonder if you rather want to talk about the topic so far because that goes back to what we talked last time about the conversation, and I'm not so sure if it connects to the current thing. So I I'm happy to postpone this just uh, for a few minutes of discussion of what we. Okay, Larry. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm curious how Mark might respond to a thought. I uh, appreciate the uh, distinction, really bringing out this distinction between synchronic and diachronic. Uh, for me, it points to the idea, the thought, the time, time is a human invention. And I see that in how you present and talk about music. I don't see it in the other two presentations in the same way. Uh, I'm just curious what you might might think about that. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm actually, I think I'm with Nicholas Luhmann here, Larry. Um, uh, Luhmann wrote this paper. Oh God, what's it called? Um, Andrew, you know what this is called. Um, in, uh, in transparency. Um, let me just find it. Um, he basically says that whenever you make a distinction, in order to maintain the stability of that distinction, time has to be created. So this is, this is Lumen in his very Spencer Brown phase. 
Um, it seems very reminiscent of the kind of arguments that Lou makes for the existence of time too. So that that's my view. Um, uh, John and a, a few of us have been talking about this, and I I I think we're fairly close, John. Yeah. Yes. I think it's an artifact. I mean, I said in my presentation that, for example, we make the error, the systematic error in thinking that we go through the life cycle from one adult to the other based upon Darwinian evolution, when in fact, based upon Lamarckian evolution, it's actually, we actually go from, we never actually leave the, the unicellular state. The zygote is sitting there calling the shots. Okay, so in that context, there is no time. Larry, you've written a lot about time. I mean, what what's what do you think? Uh, what I'm looking for in whether it's biology or physics or any science is the inclusion of the observer, mm. the scientist, uh, not as a biological entity, but as that person as John or as Fraser or as Mark. Um, included in the theory that they're formulating. The theory yes, theory formulated, they also have to be in the theory. Once I do that, I have to recognize that the idea of time is something I bring to yes. that theory. And so, yeah, I, I appreciate the Lumen uh, quote. That's, that's right on. Jimmy. You mute it. Uh, it's a follow up to Larry. I kind of learned uh, first uh, that there is a lot of wonderful metaphysics, like things that are completely unobservable and we can develop very convincing stories and we can form little clubs uh, just with membership uh, that people get thrown out if they don't agree with our story. Um, and that science actually came into existence because people said we, we like to be able to actually uh, perform experiments. And, uh, and uh, this, when our stories are of such a nature that it is impossible to conduct an experiment, then, then maybe we shouldn't call it science. But so people still can continue with their stories. But they should clearly separate it from science. And then the next major event, so that was the 1950s, is the 1980s, uh, that it was pointed out that the scientist needs to uh, acknowledge for his own role in the creation of his theories, so that he cannot develop a theory that doesn't explain his own role in the creation of his own theories. And so, my next little step then was to actually George Spencer Brown, who say, well, it all begins with the distinctions that we make. And some distinctions allow us to uh, end up with uh, sentences that we really can test and, and agree and disagree. And then other distinctions get us back in the metaphysics. So now uh, this is a question for all three presenters. I'm a little bit... Uh, Puzzled. Uh, I don't see where the metaphysics end and the science begins because I don't hear you explain how you, as a sentient human being, were reading books and decided to become a scientist or a musician, and then you actually got ideas that went back twenty thousand years ago. So, so, so you're so okay. I'll I'll leave it to you how you would like to answer because I. How can we know which story we should? That's basically the practical question. Whose club should I join? <laughs> like, yeah. who says the most? Uh... Obviously, I would, Jamie, I would, I, I, you're welcome to my club. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you yes. ask the question, John. Yes. <laughs> but, but aside from that, you, you risked a comment. Um, I would say to you that. I didn't start with a metaphysical principle. I, I, I just took what I knew scientifically and I followed. I was so frustrated with chasing my tail for 50 years. It put food on the table, okay? But it was nonsense, really. Uh, so for example, uh, Etienne Roux uh, published a paper in 2014 saying we make a systematic error in defining physiology based upon function. It's wrong. That's not the basic. He didn't offer the alternative. I do. I'm, but I'm, what I'm saying, and uh, this guy, Tom, um, Cowan, 
a, a, a cardiologist said, a heart is not a pump. It's a misconception. We yeah. just impose, you know, it's an anthropomorphism. And that's where the time base comes in, Larry, I think, to that artifact of time. We think of heart speeding and peristalsis as the timer of our, the arc of our lives. The, the unicell is actually a self-contained structure. It defines whether you're either homeostatic, mitotic, or meiotic. And that's determined by the cytoskeleton of that cell. And, I, and there's genetics that actually explains why it is that that cell, depending upon the condition it's in, will go into one of those three modalities. So it's really the unicell, which is the yeah. focus, okay? The other stuff is all artifact, in my opinion. I, I hate to denigrate our lives, but we, you know, we need to get smart here. We're, we're the only species that's destroying the planet and ourselves in the bargain. And I think it's because we're, we're the only species that knows that we know that we're mortal and that drives us nuts, <laughs> okay? That's not good. All Sorry. right. So, um, uh, Fraser? Yes. Uh, so I, I just wanted to hear <laughs> a response why I should... Uh, <laughs> The, 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 where you delineate the metaphysics from the, the science. I'm sorry, can, can you state your question? The, I wanted to hear in very clear terms where science for me is here and now that I can that mm -hmm. I can be, be present um, Okay, sorry, uh, uh, I'll restate more. Your, your being in your theory, so how your theory makes sense of your existence conceiving your framework? Okay. The anthropic. Uh, yeah, like a, yeah, in my presentation, I have already said uh, human beings are just uh, one of the millions of possibilities. Uh, just uh, we are created this way because uh, we're just uh, having a different past, like uh, what uh, yeah, there's a uh, 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 multi multiple past integral theory has explained, right? So, uh, I, 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 I think all these physics and the mathematics they are all uh, what I call uh, uh, what that word uh, um, uh, uh, anthrop. Anthropic, or as all human based, all relate to human structure, and we were not created with. We have a different, uh, um, uh, I mean, sensory organs, uh, sensory functions than the whole, whole world it would be totally different, including mathematics and uh, physics. So, in my view, is all relative, is all random, and all. Of course, it's not like a random in the mathematical. A sense like we discussed with John the other day. Uh, of course, uh, in, in mathematics, you can have a randomness, uh, you know, unlimited randomness. Okay, so you, you have uh, you know, tens of billions of uh, different choices. But if it's uh, within the constraints of physical laws, then you don't have that many choices. So you only uh, choose a different uh, number of options to form um, particles from uh, uh, human. Life. Uh, that, that's my understanding. <laughs> I, I, I'm a, I have I look very down on very low on uh, capabilities. Capabilities. Uh, I don't have hopes because I think we are locked. We are locked on the past. There's no way we can run away from uh, this uh, lockdown state. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you 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 don't believe too much in agency. Is that a way of saying it? It, it, it's a, it's a, okay. I believe in way it's uh, useful for me. It's a uh, humanistic. It's a uh, anthropic. It's a uh, good of your humans. But if we were considering science or considering philosophy, maybe we should considering uh, we should consider all this on a bigger platform uh, beyond all human structure. Okay, that's uh, I think you push your philosophy to the extreme. Then you don't want to limit yourself with your current activities and your current science. Uh, that's my point. Okay, so in this way, I'm agnostic. I, I don't, I'm not atheist. I'm not a thesis. I, I don't know. Okay, so because I'm a part, I'm a part, I'm part of the whole. How can a part to predict something big exists or does not exist? There's no way. It's against logic. Right? So <laughs> that, that, that's my philosophy. <laughs> okay. Lower. And, and Mark, yeah. uh, sorry, 
<laughs> well, okay. go ahead, go ahead. I, I think, um, I think a, a good metaphysics is a powerful driver for meaningful empirical engagements. And good experiments will produce um, a, a, a good generative metaphysical framework for continuing those experiments and driving things forwards. I, I, I think if you look at the Enlightenment, that's pretty much what happened. It, it, was, it wasn't just an empirical thing, there was a metaphysical thing going on and the two came together. Okay, all right, just as curious, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I want, I want to react to some, some things which have been said about time and, uh, and all the things which have been said, but I'm not completely sure that I'm coherent and that I'm raising a question in the end. Uh, anyhow, let me see where I come. I think it is very important to see, uh, to, to remember that the ancient Greeks had four notions of time. So time is a deeply cultural phenomenon. It's not in the zygote that you find it, you find it in the culture. And particularly if, if Jamie then comes up with the difference between time and metaphysics and science and metaphysics and the whole time plays there, I think it is very important then to look at the 17th century where people have been wrestling precisely with this problem because the modern mechanic, uh, modern uh, Cartesian thinking and the uh, Protestantism were struggling with the question of the eternity of the soul, which is a different time concept than the time concept, which is in the mechanic uh, philosophy. And then the, uh, the, uh, the infinitesimal transition comes up in 1685, 1686. Uh, gradually people move to a continuous notion of time. It's invented by Leibniz and by Newton and people gradually accept that. So we get a, a, a distance between metaphysics and the time concept and the time becomes very fundamental to modern physics. And that has changed again with evolutionary thinking, modern thinking, social, sociological thinking, and even to the point that what I began to say that the, the ancient Greek had four notions of time. I think, Mark, we should write a paper on that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and well, that's it, so fascinating about time. It is. It is not something bi biological, it's deeply cultural. Mm -hmm.